Hello, I'm Mike Hogan, Extension Educator with OSU Extension for Agriculture and Natural Resources, and today we'd like to share with you some introductory information on leasing farmland for oil and natural gas. Uh, this presentation is meant uh, to give landowners some information if you're thinking about signing a lease for oil and gas or just want to learn more about it. This information will help you understand um, all the issues uh, surrounding leasing private property for oil and gas production in Ohio. So let's go ahead and take a look at the slides. This introductory um, presentation will give an overview to landowners of uh, a whole bunch of different issues related to uh, leasing private land for oil and gas production in Ohio. One of the things we'd like to do is give you an overview of um, shale gas resources in Ohio. Uh, we'd also like to share with you information about uh, this new technology and this emerging industry in Ohio. And then we'd like to spend a, a fair amount of time um, going over some lease considerations for landowners. If you're going to lease uh, your farmland uh, for oil and gas production, what you should be thinking about, what you should be planning for in the future. And we'll spend a fair amount of time there. Then we'd also like to share with you, there are some considerations that communities have. There are a lot of questions that uh, other community members, other um, political subdivisions may have, um, even if they're not individually involved with leasing um, land for oil and gas production, there are questions that, that come up in the community that it would be wise for landowners to be aware of. And then we share with you some next steps and resources if you'd like to go ahead and lease your land for oil and gas production, uh, what you can do to, to educate yourself more and, and where you can go for more information. One caveat we always like to give is that we're not providing legal advice in this presentation. Um, many of the issues that, that we'll talk about uh, you know, are legal in nature. And, and this is, uh, you know, you're, you're selling or you're leasing uh, one of the, the bundle of property rights you have. And so certainly there are lots of legal considerations. And, and throughout this presentation, we'll suggest that uh, landowners who are interested in leasing their ground for oil and gas uh, make sure that they get a uh, council who is uh, knowledgeable about oil and gas. and, and uh, uh, while we give uh, perfunctory and introductory information about some legal questions that may arise as you go through this process, uh, we certainly are not providing legal advice during this presentation. So let's get started. Why do we have this interest in natural gas in Ohio now? You know, one is demand for, for cleaner domestic energy. Um, natural gas um, emits almost half of the carbon dioxide that coal does. And so there's this interest, uh, you know, in a, a cleaner domestic energy source, and natural gas fits the bill. So that's one reason why there is a, a pretty uh, good sized demand for this right now. Also, our, our location in Ohio is, is fairly close to very large Northeast United States markets. Uh, a lot of the natural gas usage in this country occurs on the East Coast, where our largest population centers are. And so we in Ohio are fairly close to that market, and so it will be fairly easy to, to move this, this resource um, and products that are used uh, uh, from this resource base to uh, population centers in the Northeastern part of the country. Many communities and many um, economic development professionals in our state and, 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 and uh, political leaders are interested because this industry will bring jobs with it. Um, each natural gas well site will utilize um, 410 different jobs over the life of the well. Now that doesn't mean that there'll be 400 people working on the well site at any one time, and, and that's been a, a confusing issue for some people. But over the life of the well, it will take 410 different jobs. That equals about 13 full-time equivalent jobs per well. I kind of liken it to someone building a house. If you uh, have a house built for you uh, that may take six or eight months, think of all the different people that are there from the, uh, the, the person who comes in and maybe cuts timber down to the person who does excavation, all the way to the person who uh, installs um, hardwood floors and trim, and, and then the folks that come in and do cleaning and, and polishing before you move into the house. Well, it's very similar on a, on a well site. There's, there's many, many different jobs. Some people may be there for, for a few hours. Uh, some may, people may be there for a couple of months. Um, some may, people may be there you know, more, th more than a year uh, when, when production is, is occurring on that site. But uh, even 13 jobs at each well site is a certainly positive economic benefit for many of our, our communities. And so there's this interest in natural gas because of the, the economic benefit. Um, how did we get where we are today with these shale gas plays? And shale gas play is kind of a descriptor. It's kind of a geographic descriptor, if you will. They call them plays, uh, the Marcellus play or the Utica play. Um, in the United States, production of conventional natural gas peaked um, early in 1970 and has been declining ever since. And so there's this interest in developing non-conventional um, natural gas sources. 
In the 1990s in Texas, the Barnett Shale Play was the first to use um, this new technology called horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing or fracking. A lot of people refer to it as fracking. Um, and that's, that's hydraulic fracking. And down in Texas was the first time that um, this technology, which had been used in offshore oil production, is the first time it had been used to uh, extract natural gas uh, from shale uh, in a terrestrial setting. Um, and interest has been expanding ever since. In 2000, shale gas accounted for just 1% of all natural gas produced in the United States. Today, it's more than 20% of all natural gas produced in the country, and that, that figure is rising uh, literally monthly because of all the uh, natural gas extraction from shales um, in Ohio and, and other places in the United States. This is new technology. Um, I kind of call it down and out technology. The horizontal drilling um, allows uh, drillers to go uh, a mile or more down, and then they move the direction of, of the well, of the drilling uh, technology, and then they go horizontal. And they can go up to two, two miles horizontally. And that's changing as the technology is perfected and changed. Um, that two miles is, is changing and, and getting increased. But this horizontal drilling is, is what's opened up uh, a lot of the land in Ohio and a lot of this shale resource um, for extraction. The other part of that is the hydraulic fracturing or fracking. And, and that's where we use high pressure mix of water, sand, and chemicals um, to fracture the shale. Um, the sand particles um, get, get uh, moved into the, between the, the shale that is fractured or cracked, and the sand particles hold it open, and so the natural gas is released and can flow up in the well and, and be harvested. And, and the new technology is using both of these technologies together is what's uh, enabled this, this industry to, to really take off um, it, first in Texas and in Arkansas, and then uh, in our part of the country, uh, it's, it's been perfected in, in Pennsylvania for the last uh, two, two to three years, and, and then in about the last year or so, uh, we've actually had wells drilled and just starting to produce now in, in Ohio. Here's kind of a graphic of, of why um, horizontal drilling and, and, and fracturing is uh, enabling them to, to um, get to this resource and get to this resource um, really e in a way that's um, economical th than it wasn't with, with conventional um, vertical drills, vertical wells. You can see on the left there the, the schematic of a conventional gas well that, that's drilled vertically, it goes down, and you can see the, the fracking lines there. Um, and fracking has been used, we get a lot of questions about fracking as a new technology. Um, fracking has been used uh, oh, at least the last 40 to 50 years in the United States, um, just not with this horizontal um, drilling technology. And so some form of fracking has been around. Obviously the, the technology has changed, the, the, the chemicals they use, the proportions, the mixes, um, that they use has changed, but really the technology uh, began to be used in Ohio here uh, at least 40 or 50 years ago. On the right there, you can kind of see a schematic of, of three different horizontal um, um, wells, and you can see where the, the, the well goes down um, through the, the bedrock, through uh, a lot of the, the, the topsoil and, and, and other geologic horizons below the groundwater um, here in Ohio and then goes out uh, horizontally for, for several miles. And then you can see the fractures occurring there um, that will allow the gas to escape from the shale and, and, and be harvested. You can see there's three wells here. Most of the um, pads, uh, drill wells that are being drilled right now, um, they're putting at least six wells on every pad, and there are plans to, to go greater than that, to eight. And so you can see from, from one well site, from some well, one well pad, um, they can drill a lot farther out than they can with a, a, a typical um, vertically drilled well. Um, this is reducing the footprint of this industry. Um, there will be less, um, you will see less wells. They will be a little bit larger, um, but still the footprint is pretty small. Uh, a well site that's going to have six or eight um, wells drilled on a pad is still only going to take up, you know, a maximum three to five acres is usually what they what they use, and and that's including you know areas for settling basins and and, and for truck pads and for roads and and all that. So you can see that really combining and 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 putting these wells. Um, closer together on one pad uh, makes it a lot e more economical and I think it's beneficial in that there will be less environmental impact um, and, and the footprint of, of this extractive industry will be, will be less using this technology. So why now? Why, why is there such interest? Why is the, the industry um, uh, increasing its presence at, at such a rate in Ohio? Well, 
historically there have been relatively high natural gas prices, um, stable natural gas prices. Um, just in the last year or so, those natural gas prices have come down. They're they're actually very low, uh, you know, in in early 2012, and simply because there's a glut. There's a glut because uh, we have had relatively uh, mild winter weather in most parts of the country, um, and also it, there's a glut because uh, of, of supply. Uh, there's a lot more natural gas being produced from these unconventional uh, shale gas plays, and that's just adding to supply. Uh, prices probably will, will, will change as, and fluctuate as they normally do, um, but they have been fairly stable, and, and that's uh, allowed the industry to, to explore these, these new um, unconventional um, gas production sites. Don't have to tell anybody about the high ca cost of fossil fuels. If you've filled up your, your, your tank of your car, your pickup lately, you know uh, the, the price of gasoline and fossil fuels. And so uh, the relative um, cost of natural gas is, is positive for, for, for that as a source of hydrocarbons. And, and so that has allowed the industry to, to expand. Um, there are abundant supplies. Um, with this new technology, it has opened up um, lots of different uh, geographic areas, and we'll talk a little bit more about them later on in, in this presentation. Um, but there's, uh, they're, they're, with this new technology, they're finding there's a much greater supply of natural gas in, in several geographic areas of the United States. So let's talk a little bit about what we call the Marcellus play, and you've probably heard about the Marcellus. That's the uh, the, 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 the play that got the most interest uh, in natural gas production. It's the one that we've talked most about in Ohio. It's the one that's uh, being exploited first. So what is it? Uh, the Marcellus is a low density, organic rich um, shale deposit. Uh, it's a very large um, geographic area. It, it covers about 95, almost 100,000 uh, square miles from the state of New York all the way down through Pennsylvania uh, and Ohio into West Virginia. It's very deep, about anywhere from 4,000 to 9,000 feet deep, depending on where you are in, in, in that area, and, and even in Ohio it varies. Um, the thickness of the deposit is anywhere from 5 feet thick to 250 feet thick. Uh, in Ohio, we're, we're, we're more on the, the, the low side than up near the uh, 250 feet thickness. That's typically, we see that in, in northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a, a map showing um, the areas uh, and the relative um, areas of both the Marcellus um, shale deposit and the Utica shale deposit. The, the dark side there on the very eastern part of Ohio you can see is where um, geologists believe the demarcations are for the deposits of Marcellus shale and then the, the lighter areas is where they think the Utica shale extends. And the reason I say think is because um, you know th these geology maps are, are changing um, as new wells are drilled and as more seismic testing and other um, uh, testing is done, uh, they're really perfecting where these lines are. And, and so over time, these lines have changed and they will continue to change uh, in, the, in the near future as we see more drilling and more exploration throughout Ohio. The Marcellus play is 400 mil million years old. It was discovered first in, in the town of Marcellus, New York in the early 1800s. Actually in, in that town, the, the, the actual um, shale outcrops there, much like we have uh, limestone and sandstone outcroppings here in Ohio, they have outcroppings of this Marcellus shale above ground there, and that's where it was first discovered. So they've known about the shale, known about the resource uh, for, for many years. Uh, it is the largest shale gas play in the United States geographically. Um, there are many other shale gas uh, plays in Texas, Arkansas, um, Kansas, uh, uh, north in the Dakotas, uh, but this is the largest one. It covers the most uh, uh, square miles and, and with a thickness in different areas, it's the, it's the largest source of shale gas uh, it's thought to be in, in the United States. Uh, as you saw from the map, it's under uh, the Marcellus, it's mostly under the eastern quarter of Ohio, including the eastern uh, basin of Lake Erie. Now the Utica is, is, is a play that's, that's getting a lot more attention now than it did a year ago. Uh, and as I said, most of that is because uh, geologists and, and the um, oil and gas industry are learning more and more about this as they do more testing and, and, and those results are, are made public and evaluated. The Utica play is also a shale formation. It's below the Marcellus. And as you saw from the map, it, it's thought to cover about the central third of Ohio. And so where the industry first thought that uh, they would target the, the very um, eastern part of the state for this industry, uh, over time, the industry most likely is going to spread throughout many more counties covering central Ohio because of this Utica shale. Uh, the Utica is a little bit different than the Marcellus in that it contains what we call more wet gas. That wet gas is, is liquid hydrocarbon components such as propane and butane and ethane, and what they're finding is a lot more oil. 
and uh, going back to the, the fossil fuel um, prices, which, which uh, certainly fluctuate but never seem to trend uh, down for very long, that oil is, is becoming uh, more and more valuable uh, to, to these natural gas companies and oil drillers that are looking at these uh, uh, wells in, in both the Utica and the Marcellus. The ethane is also very valuable, it's, uh, as, as are the propane and the butane, but the ethane is particularly valuable. It's used a lot, it, it produced plastics. Uh, it, it's estimated that, that uh, I've seen estimates that 75 to, to 90 percent of all plastic products that you pick up and you use in, in your daily life uh, are, uses ethane as a component. And so uh, it is thought that, that um, just the ethane uh, component of this will be a source for a whole new industry in Ohio. And um, a very large company, uh, 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 Royal Dutch Shell, ha has uh, announced plans to build an ethane cracker plant, a, a plant where they take ethane and break it down into different uh, 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 parts to be used in plastic uh, production. Uh, will be located in, in somewhere in, in Ohio, Pennsylvania, or West Virginia. And so this is an industry that's going to have a lot of spin-offs. It's not just going to be the, the actual hydro hydrocarbons themselves and extracting the, uh, the oil and gas uh, from the wells that are going to produce jobs locally. Um, the the um, allied industries that, that take the uh, hydrocarbons and break them down and almost add value to them will also produce a lot of jobs in the state. One of the things that, that we worry about, that, that we get lots of questions about, and that people uh, rightfully uh, so are concerned about, uh, they ask who regulates the industry and, and what are the environmental concerns and, and issues surrounding this new industry. Oil and gas is, in Ohio is regulated by, as an industry, by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Mineral Resources. Now EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, um, also gets involved in that they regulate air and water quality. And so the air and water quality issues that, that might be surrounding these production sites uh, will be regulated by the Ohio EPA as well. Groundwater is, it, protection is, is the number one concern uh, for most uh, landowners and most communities, and, and um, it's one that, that should be uh, taken seriously. There's also some concern about air quality, especially at sites once production starts and they locate um, compressor stations um, and, and other uh, components of the industry. Sometimes they vent off uh, fumes, and so air quality is a concern, and, and it is an issue that um, is looked at by regulators. Uh, one that sometimes we don't think about is noise. Um, if you're a landowner, where uh, on your land that, that the, um, the well head is going to be located on, uh, at least during drilling and, and potentially during the entire phase of production, um, there's going to be some noise. And so that's a consideration if you're a landowner thinking about leasing your ground, you know, where this well might be located, where the pad might be located, noise would be one thing you'd want to be concerned about. There have been some concerns about radioactivity. There, there certainly is natural uh, radioactivity, um, background uh, radon and, and radioactivity in the, the substrata. And in Pennsylvania, they have seen some of that uh, come back and flow back in, in water and brine. And so that's a concern and, and something that regulators um, take a look at. Well, another one that we don't always think about, um, or landowners may not always think about, is what I call view shed issues. Um, and we've got a couple of photos later on in this presentation, but um, for a, a, a good part of the production cycle, you're going to have to look at this if this, this is located in your backyard, uh, especially when the well is being drilled, when it's being fracked. Um, you're going to have this this 200 foot derrick uh, outside your your back door, depending on how close it is, and so um, it's going to change what you know the back 40, if you will, looks like. And so that's something to think about when you're considering uh, a lease and and considering having uh, the well pad located on your property. One that we didn't think about, we, that, that we didn't discuss in the beginning, that, that, that there wasn't concern from and early on in this industry is, is the whole issue about seismic activity. And if you've been watching the news, uh, you know, late in, well, throughout the, the 2011 and especially later in 2011, um, in the Youngstown area in, in northeastern Ohio, there has been uh, increased uh, seismic activity very close to an injection well site. That doesn't happen to be a site where they were drilling uh, uh, wells into the Marcellus or Utica, it happens to be a, a site where they had a deep well drilled for disposal of um, brine and flowback water from uh, wells at other sites, primarily in Pennsylvania. Um, and so there, there is research uh, starting to be conducting on this whole area of are there seismic effects that uh, these deep wells could have uh, in places where there are um, seismic activity. 
Uh, this has also been a concern in other parts of the country, in, in particularly in Arkansas, where they have drilled some of these deep wells. And so that's, that's something that uh, folks are asking about, and that's something that research is just really getting started on, but it's something that will probably be discussed in the, in the future. One of the reasons that water is such a, a, a concern is, is one reason is that the industry uses large quantities of water to drill these wells. Um, for each well that's, that's drilled and fracked, um, up to five million um, gallons of water are used in the process during the, the, the fracking process. And so that's, that's a lot of fresh water that has to be used uh, during the industry. About half of that water returns to the surface as flowback. And so any, any um, contamination that uh, happens underground, whether it's uh, with radioactivity, radioactivity um, or just other um, um, salty deposits um, or any other uh, minerals, uh, come back in that water. And so the, the water has to be handled accordingly. Much of this water is now recycled. Typically in Pennsylvania, early on in, in the, as the industry was, was beginning uh, in the last few years, a lot of that water was disposed of in um, both injection wells, uh, primarily in Ohio because our geology is different than Pennsylvania, um, and then it was also uh, taken to local wastewater treatment facilities. Um, there were some concerns that, uh, that some of that was not uh, being treated successfully, uh, especially when it had the, the radioactivity component to it and uh, was released back into to fresh water systems in that state. And so the industry has really done a lot to start recycling the water. And a lot of that water um, is now recycled. Some drillers, some companies do a much better job with this. They're, they're, they're recycling a much larger percentage of the water they use. Um, but they, they recycle it on site and then they also take it to the next site. And what we're seeing is, is, is wells that are being drilled um, in a general vicinity closer to each other so that they can make it easier to share resources, share technology, and then also use the water and recycle the water. And so um, this is a part of the industry, the part of the technology that is evolving over time. Um, I sometimes tell people, you know, we, we're a little bit of guinea pigs um, in Ohio because this technology has is, is, uh, not been around for years. The industry hasn't been around for years. Um, Pennsylvania was probably the first guinea pig, and we're kind of the second generation guinea pig. Um, but the, the companies are learning as they go, and the technology is changing. And certainly um, that has caused citizens to, to uh, ask for, for close uh, oversight of this industry. And, and certainly that's, that's a prudent question for the public to ask. In addition to, to those issues, there's kind of some broader issues, some community issues. Um, I mentioned the number of jobs. There will be some economic impact in a community, and many political subdivisions, counties, townships, um, villages are, are, are asking questions about this industry and looking at how will this industry impact their communities. And certainly there will be a positive impact. Um, we are starting to see spin-off um, businesses in northeastern Ohio um, ramp up to, to develop, to, to support um, the, the drilling industry, um, pipeline uh, construction companies, and, and other industries like that. And so there will be positive impact in, in communities. There will also be impacts on infrastructures. Um, with these, these wells come lots and lots of trucks. And we talked about five million gallons of water. That water really isn't there on site in, in, most, uh, in, in virtually all cases in eastern Ohio. And so it has to be trucked in. And so that's a lot of trucks. That's, that's a lot of trucks on, on roads. And so there will be some impacts on infrastructure. Um, and, and so many communities are, are uh, developing uh, road use agreements and asking um, the um, energy companies to sign road use agreements. Um, many companies are coming in and looking at where they want to locate wells. And they're going ahead and improving, working with township trustees and counties and actually um, paying to improve roads before they ever bring their trucks on so that they don't have to uh, come back and repair. Uh, they know that, that the township roads and some county roads will not support the, the, the impact from the, this industry. And so they have gone ahead and starting investing in, in roads up front. And so this is, these are issues that township trustees and county commissioners and engineers have to deal with in, in communities for roads. Um, also for emergency services. Um, there, there was an instance about a year ago of a, a, it was not a horizontally drilled well, but a well fire in Columbiana County. And um, 
the local uh, fire departments uh, were, were really pressed to, to know how to respond to this partic particular type of emergency. And so um, many communities, as they're looking at what the impacts will be of this industry, uh, the emergency services, particularly firefighting, are ones that are gearing up and, and getting specialized training, um, having to look at purchasing specialized equipment or supplies to fight um, these specific types of, of fires. And so this is going to be a cost for some communities, and, and some communities are asking uh, the industry to, 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 to assist and, and cost share on the, the purchasing or sharing of services and, and supplies. There may also be an opportunity for some municipalities who have good sources of water and large sources of water to actually work with companies to sell water. There have been some villages in eastern Ohio that have already drilled uh, additional wells. They've signed contracts with uh, these companies to supply the water that's used on these wells. And so um, it, it may be a way to, to improve the, 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 the uh, infrastructure of, of the water system in what is usually a small uh, community that doesn't serve many, many residents, um, and, and so that will be an impact on, on some communities. There could be an impact on, on certain school systems. Um, some communities will see influxes of um, families that are working at these sites. Um, they, that, may not, that may not be permanent population increases, but it may be over several years, and so there may be um, new um, uh, enrollments in, in some schools. That they've seen this in Pennsylvania and a little bit in, in New York, uh, spillover from northeastern Pennsylvania to New York State, um, so that there could be impacts in, in some school districts like that. Tourism is also a concern for some communities. In some communities where there will be large um, numbers of temporary employees, um, there will be a shortage of hotel rooms. Uh, we have taken groups of uh, county commissioners, other public officials over to western Pennsylvania where this industry has, has uh, been in existence for a few years and they've had a shortage of hotel rooms and there has been some impact on the, the native tourism industry because the, there have been uh, shortages of hotel rooms for tourists because those rooms are being used by, by itinerant workers for, for this industry. And so that, that could be a concern. And, and some folks are questioning uh, whether, you know, uh, having lots and lots of what looks like industrial sites um, in, in amongst farmland and, and countryside will impact on some tourism activities uh, in Ohio. And, and uh, not saying that they, they certainly can't coexist, but that's a concern and that should be an issue that some communities may want to discuss as this industry starts to develop in their, their local community. Another issue is job training. Um, most communities welcome the jobs, um, but many communities do not have a uh, ready pool of uh, local labor that are sk have skill sets that uh, match the, the needs of the industry. And so there needs to be some attention given to job training uh, through community colleges and, and vocational schools and, and even secondary school systems in some cases so that um, local labor can be used on these well sites. There may also be a, a great opportunity for some philanthropy in some very small rural communities that, that don't have lots of opportunities, don't have lots of sources of philanthropy in their communities. Uh, this may be a, another time uh, you know, in history where we see uh, a good uh, uh, benefits come in small communities from philanthrop philanthropy. And uh, wise communities would plan for this and, and be strategic and uh, work with companies as they start to, to evolve in their communities. And another thing to think about, economists uh, continue to point out to us that the, the, the historic boom or bust nature of this industry, um, not that, that, that uh, that's a reason why we wouldn't want to embrace this industry in most of our communities in, in Ohio, but that there is this cyclical nature of most of these en energy industries. And, and there's reasons to suggest that the natural gas uh, industry will be the same, that, that we will certainly have cycles of uh, of additional jobs and we will then be followed by uh, you know a contraction uh, of those jobs in a community and so as communities plan for this industry they need to keep keep that in mind in that uh, you know th this may be an industry that is timed out it, it may not be here 50 years from now it may look very different 50 years from now it may not be as intensive in a community it may be more extensive um, as the industry evolves in Ohio well, there's a long, what I call a long road to drilling once um, these leases start to be uh, offered in your area. These are kind of the, the progression of, of this, if you will. The, the first thing that happens, and we've seen happen for probably two years now in eastern Ohio, and this is, is migrating west 
uh, into central Ohio uh, right now is landmen tie up acreage. They approach private landowners and, and offer them a, a, a bonus payment to lease out their land. Um, they do nothing more than identify acreage and, and, and get pen to paper, uh, get contracts signed and tie up acreages. They then sell those leases to some energy development company. And some landowners are concerned about that. They say, um, I, I'm not going to eventually be dealing with the person who, who I leased my ground to. And that's, that's just the way this industry is. One of the largest players in the industry is, is met with OSU Extension and, and has told us that they are considering actually hiring their own landmen so they don't have to have um, uh, other uh, private contractors that they work with. But up to now, um, this is the way the industry works. The landmen first come in and then they sell the leases. Um, those leases may get sold or what we call flip two or three times uh, before uh, any drilling might take place. And so that's something as a private landowner to think about and, and we'll talk a little about how you can structure that lease so that you at least know about that um, throughout the life of the contract. Then there's exploration, and, and this probably will be uh, moving again west in Ohio, but, but for at least the last couple of years uh, throughout townships in, in eastern Ohio, you see lots of trucks spreading lots of uh, wires throughout farm fields and along township roads, and they're doing uh, testing to try to map exactly where the geology is. Most of this is seismic technology, um, but, but this is added to the understanding of, of where exactly this geology is and where its different um, depths are in different counties in Ohio. The next phase is development, the actual drilling. You know, that's when most people start to physically see action in their community, when they're driving the roads and they're seeing the trucks, they're seeing the 200-foot rigs go up in the sky. Concurrent with that is this development of the support infrastructure, and we're currently seeing that in many communities in eastern Ohio um, where um, industry comes in from, from outside the, the geographic area, and we, we're starting to see local businesses expand and um, uh, as they develop um, support for this industry. Um, there are lots of opportunities for small businesses to, to cater to um, different needs that, that the drilling industry will have. And then there's production. That's when the actual oil and gas starts to flow. That, that's when the pipelines are in and, and it, it starts moving uh, to, to market to be broken down into to different uh, products. And then eventually uh, what happens to the well is that it's plugged. And this is a, a part of the, the life of the well that's very well regulated. Uh, ODNR has, has uh, rules and regulations on how, how the well is plugged. But eventually uh, there will come a point when, when production isn't economically feasible anymore, depending on the, the, the price complex of, of, of the resource. And then the well gets plugged. So if you want to lease, what, what are some of the things you should be thinking about if you're, if you're considering leasing uh, your ground for oil and gas production? The first thing you have to investigate is do you actually own the mineral estate on your land? Um, the mineral estate or the mineral rights may have been severed from the surface estate. You may not have done this. This may have happened years ago. You may have purchased the, the land um, without even realizing that you didn't have the, the mineral rights or that the mineral estate wasn't part of the, the surface estate. Uh, heirs uh, or grandparents or previous owners may have sold those rights um, or it may have never had them themselves. That's the first thing you have to do is actually go to the courthouse uh, and, and research the deed, research transfers, and look and see where the mineral estate is, whether or not it, it runs with your deed. If you find that you don't own the, the, the mineral rights to your land, Ohio has a, a law that's, that's very useful to, uh, very positive for, for landowners. Uh, the Dormant Mineral Act is a law that allows landowners to recover the mineral estate um, if it is truly dormant. If the, the owners of the, the, that mineral rights um, are not in business anymore, um, their heirs are not living, um, an attorney has to do this for you. It's not a terribly, um, in most cases, it's not a terribly expensive or a terribly um, long or complicated process. Um, but if truly the, the uh, rights have never been exercised and are dormant, um, then the landowner can recover them, they put back on the deed, and then they are yours to go ahead and lease um, for oil and gas production uh, in the state. OSU Extension has a fact sheet, um, a fairly new fact sheet on this, um, showing you the, the process and, and, and talking about how to work with an attorney to accomplish this. And uh, if you go to your local uh, county extension agent or if you go to our OSU Extension website, you can find the, the, the new fact sheet that uh, has been written on the Dormant Mineral Act in Ohio. Throughout this process, you have to engage an attorney who's familiar with oil and gas. And probably the, the most important uh, word there in, in that suggestion is familiar. Um, many attorneys 
are doing work with oil and gas, many attorneys that you might visit uh, in, in your small town um, or even larger town, um, and you go and ask, will you help me with uh, oil and gas uh, issues I have on my land, most of them will say yes, but you have to ask a second question. You have to say, are you familiar? Do you do a lot of business? Do you have experience with oil and gas issues for private landowners? Um, it's not enough to just get um, advice of counsel or help from an attorney in these processes. It, it's more important that you f identify an attorney who has uh, experience specifically with, with oil and gas issues. Um, many um, different groups uh, have um, resource lists that they have put together uh, of um, attorneys who have a fair amount of experience with oil and gas. Uh, Ohio Farm Bureau in most counties has a list of attorneys um, that have worked with many landowners. Um, your OSU Extension Office in most counties can provide you with, with a list. Um, and, and these are not lists of recommended attorneys or professionals. They're simply lists uh, sharing with you uh, folks that have experience with oil and gas, folks that have participated in oil and gas professional development programs um, for their profession. Um, it's, it's critically important that you work with an attorney who, who has experience, um, not someone who, who says they, they can do this work and, and learn as they go. And so seek advice, um, ask for references, ask for the names of other property owners that they've worked with relative to oil and gas in, in your community. Some other considerations. Well, how will you be paid if you decide to go ahead and sign a lease for oil and gas? The industry now basically has a, a more simplified payment than, than the traditional oil and gas um, payments were made. There is what's called a, a bonus payment, and that's a one time per acre payment that you will receive traditionally when you sign the lease. Um, it, it may be uh, 60, 30, 90 days after signing, that will be in the lease, but it's this one time payment per acre that you will receive uh, for leasing your land. Then there will be royalties. Once production starts, um, you will be paid a royalty depending on how much oil and gas are produced um, from your property. Um, typically, that, the, the percentage is, has been about 12.5%. Um, more recently, that has bumped up to, uh, it's more common to, to receive 18 to 20% of royalties um, in your contract. Again, these are things that would be in your contract that you negotiate. Um, and they certainly aren't paid until the, the, the oil or gas uh, are extracted and, and start flowing. And, and it's wise to note this will be in your contract, but, but uh, you will be paid um, those royalties after the, the cost of production. In other words, you will pay, be paid royalties net, um, not gross, uh, after the, the production companies uh, assign the cost to, to extract that resource. Then if there's a um, if there's an oil well pad placed on your property, um, you will be paid separately a land rental fee, uh, what the industry calls a spud fee. And, and that's only paid to the property owner where the, the well is located. As we mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, because the technology has changed, uh, you're not gonna drive around the countryside and, and on every farm see maybe three or four different um, wells like we used to see for, for, for traditional vertical oil and gas wells. Um, one well can uh, one well pad uh, using the the horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing um, can extract uh, oil and gas from 12 to 1400 acres and that's changing as the technology changes and that's changing as they put more wells per pad and so there's going to be fewer actual well sites and so you may decide that you don't want a well located on your property. You want a lease, you may want to lease the, the rights to, to, to the oil and gas in your property, but for some reason you decide you don't want to have that, that uh, well site on your property. That you can stipulate in, in the contract. Um, you may be paid a, a smaller uh, per acre uh, lease payment or bonus payment, um, but you know depending on your objectives, that, that certainly may be something that, that you might want to consider and might be positive for you. We say that the goal of a good oil and gas lease should be to maximize economic gain, but also protect the land and its use. Um, you know, so it shouldn't be just to, to see uh, what's the highest amount per acre you can get for that bonus payment, but um, how can you, you maximize that, that economic return, that payment to you, but also get a, get a, a lease that's gonna protect, protect the land uh, and its use. Um, I like to say that bad leases are worse than bad marriages, and the reason for that is, uh, you know, bad marriages, you can, you can find an attorney to, to end those. Uh, unless there's egregious fraud involved, um, most landowners are not going to be able to find a, an attorney who's going to be able to get them out of a, a bad lease 
uh, for oil and gas. And, and so really, uh, you've got to do your homework. Leases, leases for oil and gas are not something that, that uh, you should be pressured into signing quickly. Um, and we've heard all sorts of stories where uh, a landowner says that uh, the, the contract that they've been presented by the landman uh, said that the landman said it's got to be signed by the end of the month or they're taking it back. And, and certainly that would be the first red flag that there should not be any real pressure for a landowner. Uh, there should be time for you to, to work with your attorney um, to investigate the company, talk to other property owners to see what uh, their experiences have been with, with, with this, this landman or the, the company that you're dealing with. And uh, certainly being pressured is just like any contract is not a, a positive thing. One thing to remember is the lease is typically written from the perspective of the person presenting it. What that means is um, the, the, the company is, is going to want to maximize the benefit to them. Um, may, certainly we, we don't think that they are out to, to um, take advantage of you, the landowner, but the lease is going to be written that benefits them the most. And, and certainly you could sign that first lease. But the best thing to do is to negotiate and, and try to come up with a, a, a uh, midpoint where the benefits are uh, certainly not equal, but maybe equitable to both the lessor and the lessee, the company and the landowner. And so just because uh, you're presented the lease doesn't mean that uh, that's the lease that has to be signed or, or will be signed. Um, many times the, the, uh, what's called the standard oil and gas lease is what's presented to the landowner. And that's not the, the best lease that, that you're going to see. The entire le lease is negotiable. Uh, we've heard landowners say that, uh, that someone presented them with a lease and said, take it or leave it, that this, we don't change these leases. Well, that's not the true or not really the case. The entire lease is negotiable. You're the landowner, you own this resource, you own this part of the, the bundle of property rights that you own for your property, and so you're the one that's really in the driver's seat. Obviously, you may have some demands that, that either cannot or will not be met, but you're the one to decide that or determine that. Everything in that lease is negotiable. Certainly, uh, you, you couldn't put something in a lease that was contrary to, to law or regulation, uh, but most uh, you know, covenants and items in the lease are, are negotiable and, and, and should be negotiable. Uh, one of our, our extension specialists that, that works in, in, in this area always says that the first lease you see is probably the worst lease you see. And, and what she means by that is that first lease will be written to benefit the, uh, the, oh, the, the purchaser, the, the company, the, the energy company, more than it is the property owner. And so you have to have a negotiation so that uh, you, you, you include in that lease covenants that benefit you uh, more and, and come to an agreement with both parties. Some things that should be included in the lease, obviously the specific description of the property. That sounds very uh, elementary, and it is, but uh, it should be very specific. It, sh it should include all parcel numbers and, and any deed recording um, uh, items that, are, that, that are, are, are contained on your deed and description of property should be in the lease. The length of the primary term should be on there. Typically, that's five years. Uh, most companies will want a five-year primary term with an automatic uh, renewal for another five years. And what the primary term means is that's the amount of time that the, the purchaser, the company, has to um, start to make progress on, on uh, producing something from that your land, okay? And uh, certainly lawyers are saying that uh, defining what makes progress will, could be something that eventually ends up in court, but that primary term is, is five plus five, five years uh, with an automatic renewal for, for five years. And so that's the, the length that the company has to, to uh, start drilling on your property. The lease should include specific formations. It shouldn't just say any and all hydrocarbons. It should say what formations. It should say uh, natural gas, oil, and other hydrocarbons in the Marcellus and the Utica. It, it should be as specific as, as you can get it. It should also say only in oil and gas and their constituents are included in, in the lease. Um, we really don't know 50 or 100 years from now what else um, underground uh, in the geology might be valuable. Certainly our, our grandparents and great-grandparents never dreamed that, that these hydrocarbons locked up in shale gas under, under their land uh, you know, would be valuable. And so um, the lease should, should state that only oil and gas and their constituents are included uh, in the contract. 
It should also include a negotiation or arbitration clause. Uh, it certainly won't be uncommon for there to be disagreements between the lesser and the lessee. And so how are you going to settle those? Uh, how are you going to arbitrate those? Um, this can be beneficial so that uh, you can solve problems without people having to go to court or having to, to, to sue one another. And so that should be a, a, a component of, of a good lease. The lease should also indemn indemnify you as the landowner. Um, if, especially if these wells are drilled on your property, there will be many different contractors that are involved. And certainly it is wise for you to be held harmless um, because of problems caused by anybody that, that uh, works on that well. Um, even if the, the actual well site isn't uh, located on your property, uh, certainly just extracting the, the, the resource from your property is caused to have, for you to be indemnified, uh, especially in case there was ever accidents that would cause harm to natural resources such as groundwater. Um, you you want to be uh, make sure that, that the folks who, who caused the problem are the ones that are held legally responsible. Also there should be what's called a poo clause. The poo clause is a, is a, 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 a legal um, definition that limits the ability to tie up non-producing lands beyond the term of the lease. Um, th what this does is this helps you um, if you have a company that, that you were under contract with but they're not fully utilizing your resource, um, they have you maybe pooled with in, in a unit um, where they're not using all of the acreage that you have under lease and so you're not getting royalties, um, it limits the ability of companies to, to uh, continually tie up that ground. It frees you up to be able to go and sell your resource to somebody else that actually wants to produce and so you start to get royalties flowing. And so most attorneys who, who uh, are going to work on oil and gas should be very, very uh, familiar with the poo clause and would certainly recommend most likely that you have the poo clause included in any contract you sign for your property. The lease should also include the very precise location of all roads, structures, basically anything that's going to be on your property, uh, compressor stations, storage, or condensa condensation tanks. Um, if there are places that you don't want these things to be, that should be included in the, in the, the lease that you sign. Uh, if there needs to be timber removed to actually build a road or to build a well site, uh, the provision for, for uh, who, uh, who's going to do that, uh, who gets paid, how much you get paid, all that should be in the contract. Um, what, what we're seeing, I think, it, it, in our area in eastern Ohio is a general, um, in, in general, this is becoming less of an issue because uh, companies are trying to um, be more strategic in where they locate these sites. They're trying to locate them closer to roads for, for many reasons. Um, and, and so we're, we're, unlike the traditional conventional vertical um, sites that are were scattered over a farm or s scattered over land, um, we're seeing more strategic location and as I mentioned, much fewer number uh, of these, much smaller footprint of these. And so this is getting to be less of an issue, but it should be included in, in the contract in case it happens on your land. The same thing would be for repair of fences or reclamation of ground. If they have to get through crop ground or, or, or places that uh, you, you normally plant crops or want to plant crops in the future, um, the, the fixing or replacement of fences and, and how the ground is reclaimed um, after they, they, they build it so that you can put it back to the, to the use that you want it to be in, whether that's you know hay ground or, or cultivated land for, for crops. The lease should also include an assignment clause. That's where if um, the company sells uh, the contract to someone else or assigns it to someone else, um, most companies will not um, probably won't sign a contract that allows you to approve those assignments or sales, but one thing you can do is require landowner uh, notification at a very minimum. It would be nice and beneficial for, as a landowner if you can require approval of, of who they sell that to and when they sell it to, or it would be wonderful if in that case you could include um, that, that you share in, in any financial returns of that. Um, maybe uh, a company might buy uh, your lease for $6,000 today in 2012, but maybe next year that that, that resource uh, because of the industry uh, or because of prices, maybe that resource is worth ten thousand dollars per acre. Um, I, I've seen some um, landowner groups that have included a provision in the lease that every time that is sold uh, for a higher amount, that the landowner receives a percentage of that higher amount. Will you get uh, companies to sign that lease? I don't know, um, but it's certainly worth asking for, and in the very minimum. Um, you should probably ask for to be notified when those those sales are made, when those assignments are made. There should probably also be a limit on unitization, how many acres um, that, that you can be pooled with. 
Uh, Ohio is, is a state that allows pooling, and so um, sometimes there are negative effects for certain landowners when those units get larger, and so you may want to limit um, the, the size and, and how many um, acres they put together in, in one unit so that, that uh, you aren't uh, harmed by those larger units. You definitely want to have a land rental or a spud fee anytime that they're going to use your land for, for any, any, um, uh, anything. If, if uh, the well is going to be located on your site, you, on your property, you should have a, a separate fee in addition to the, the, the leasing per acre bonus fee. You should get a land rental fee or what the industry calls a spud fee. This is one of the most important components of, of a lease, we think, is, is the whole issue of groundwater protection. You want to protect both the quality and the quantity of groundwater um, from the industry. And so um, these, this consideration should be given top priority in a lease, and, and these types of things should, should definitely be in, in most leases. There should be a water replacement clause, just in case something does happen negative and the, either the quality or the quantity of, of your um, well water is, is damaged, um, who's going to replace it? And, and there should be testing of the water by a third party at the expense of the company or the lessee. Um, it, it should be done by a third party, obviously, so that, it, that, that, uh, that, that holds up in court. Um, you don't want to do it. You don't want the company to do it. You want it done by a third party, and you don't want to pay for it. You want the company to pay for it. These things should, should be in a lease. And the water replacement clause should be in perpetuity. Um, I've seen several contracts recently where um, folks, farmers, have gone ahead and signed that, that um, companies in the lease say that if they harm, if they're proven to harm the, the quality or the quantity of the water, that they will replace it at their cost for 20 years or, or some other timed uh, uh, length. The problem is, is 20 years sounds like a long ter term, but if the groundwater is, is harmed and can't be used, uh, 20 years, uh, what's going to happen in 20 years? You know, do you really want to have uh, uh, that problem for, for your heirs or, or someone else? And so really, the, 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 if the water uh, is harmed, the water replacement should be in perpetuity or in terms of return to the quality and quantity that existed before the, the impact by the company. There are lots of things that the lease should not include. Um, one of the big ones is right-of-ways for transmission pipelines. Those should be handled in separate contracts. And typically they are. They're, they're typically um, uh, not sold to the same uh, uh, entity or company. Um, but, but even if, if a contract wants to just have the right-of-way, um, that should not be included in, in a lease. That should be a whole separate lease that, that you would sign as a landowner. The lease should not include gas or brine storage on your property unless for some reason you, you have uh, the, the objective that you want that. Most landowners would, would not want that and, and, and that should not be handled if for some reason you, you would agree to that. That would most likely be in, a, in an entirely different lease um, with an entirely different and additional payment and not in the, the, the lease that you signed to, for, to selling the, the, the rights for the oil and gas on your property. You sh also shouldn't have access to the water source. Maybe for some reason you have a very large pond or a lake on your property um, and uh, the company might want to use that. That definitely we would recommend to not be in uh, the contract. Even if you decide that you want to sell that water, you have uh, a, a very good supply, uh, um, that's fine, but handle that in an, in an entirely different contract, an entirely different lease. Um, don't roll that into the, the, the lease that you signed for, for oil and, and gas. Basically what, what we suggest is you never give away anything. All of the things that companies or entities might be interested in on your land or resources that you have, um, sell them. Uh, and, and sell them probably using different uh, covenants or different contracts uh, for, for those different items. Typically the lease will terminate if no activity starts during that primary term that I mentioned, which is usually five plus five, so ten years. Um, the question is, you know, what constitutes activity? And that certainly would be a, will be a legal issue, my guess is, in this state, uh, you know, a few years from now. Um, is, is does putting survey flags and coming out with a crew, coming out with a pickup truck and spade shovels and digging some holes, uh, you know, is that activity? Um, that certainly would be for, for the courts to, to, to decide. But the, the lease typically will say that it terminates if no activity commences during that, that primary term. So what, what does this industry look like? Here are some photos of, of um, actual um, um, wells in, in the Marcellus area in, in eastern Ohio. Um, th this is the, a typical well site. 
Um, we don't always see the, that large screen fence you see there, but um, this year in 2011 and 12, the companies have expressed uh, an interest that they're going to work throughout the winter, and so uh, most of that is for, for windbreak. But typically there will be a fence, some type of fence for, for protection. You'll see there's been a lot of land work here, um, some diversion work to, to divert wa water away from the site, and certainly there was a lot of grading that went on in the site. But certainly you can see these are very large um, uh, rigs that, that uh, uh, appear um, out of place or, or certainly not what you would typically see in the farmlands and forests of, uh, of, of Ohio. This uh, is a site just down the road from that first one there and you can see uh, how they've uh, been, they're a little farther off the road in this site and, and how there is some, some land uh, change, uh, excavation and, and, and changes that are being made to this site. Um, a site that's been used for cropping. And so, um, you know, just think about how, uh, what the impact of this is going to be on your um, enterprise and, and how you want it to dovetail if there's going to be a, a uh, well site on your property. The, the, a, a good company will uh, spend time doing proper um, soil and water conservation practices so that there's diversion of surface water and that there's also protection that when there are um, problems when, when there is a spill or a leak uh, on the surface that those spills can be contained and certainly not enter surface water and the, the, the spill is contained and, and a minimization to the, uh, the environment is, is, is controlled. I don't, uh, I'm certainly not a, a professional photographer and this isn't a great, I don't have a great nighttime camera, but what I want to show you here, this is that same rig at night. And so um, these sites are lit very well. The rig, is, the rig itself has lights all the way to the top, but there is lots and lots of ground lights. The site is typically worked 24-7 uh, and so there'll be trucks moving in 24-7. You'll have that noise and you'll also have the, the light. And, and so this is just uh, something to consider. I would suggest to landowners who are considering signing a lease and, and, and are considering um, allowing uh, a well site on their property, go and take a look at these well sites. Um, most of them, all of them are secure and, and, and the general public you know, isn't allowed onto the site, but you can certainly travel the roads in eastern Ohio and many of our counties now and find these sites during the day. Uh, you'll, you'll see them uh, and, and just go and look and see how they look out uh, the back window of, of, of someone's home or farm um, just to see if, if that's something that's going to be compatible with the objectives that you have for, for your land. Now certainly the rig, uh, this rig isn't there uh, for the life of the well, but depending on the, the, the depth that they have to drill, depending on the geology, um, depending on the, the production uh, that, that they do find, um, these can be there anywhere from three months to, to, to a year or more um, before the, the, the well uh, rig is actually moved and, and the, the well is actually producing and either connected to a pipeline or um, the, the hydrocarbon products are, are trucked off site. Um, but certainly the, the, the rig, the, the drilling and fracking process are the ones that are uh, most noticeable and, and probably the, the time where there'd be the, uh, the most issues for, for neighboring landowners. There will be plenty and plenty of truck traffic. And you can see one company here does a decent job of posting uh, you know, down the road that, that the, there are truck entrances um, because there will be um, just hundreds and hundreds of trucks that, that move through these sites. Um, where I live, my, my home is on a road where one of these sites was located and uh, during the summer I was, uh, I was outside uh, in my house quite a bit and um, there, would be, there would be times when 20 and 30 trucks would be coming through in a group when they were fracking um, containing the water and the chemical mixes and uh, it was just like an army of trucks and so that's just something to consider that, that there will be some impact not only to the roads but on the, the quality of life if you will right around where these, these wells are, are going to be located. Here, here's a shot of just a depot of one company where they, they are keeping literally hundreds of trucks. I, I, I quit counting, I think at 130 some. Um, and this is just a depot where they store the trucks and they move them in and, in and out of. And so there's just a tremendous, and this was just, these are just trucks for, for liquids, for the fracking fluids and water. Um, not any of the, the supplies or, 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 or the, uh, the, the construction or uh, actual worker uh, uh, movement. These are just for the, for the, the, the liquid components for the pr fracking process. So there, there's going to be tremendous increased truck traffic to, to these sites in, in your community. 
After the, the drilling, then you're going to see what I mentioned, the, the support infrastructure develop. Uh, here's an example of a pipeline being put in um, very close to where those, those first few photos of, uh, of those uh, wells were, were located. The, the pipeline was, was installed and this will have a, a, an effect on roads and, and school bus travel and um, all those types of things that uh, communities have to think about relative to this industry. So what happens when the money starts to flow? Uh, if you decide to go ahead and, and, and sign a lease, you're obviously going to have a tax liability, and that's just something to think about up front. There certainly are ways to, to minimize your tax liability, to structure your tax liability so it's most positive for you depending on your situation, depending on your income, uh, depending on maybe changes in farm income or, 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 or depending on your, your personal situation. But that's something that should be thought about up front long before you sign the lease um, because you can structure the lease to say exactly how you'll be paid and when you'll be paid. Um, perhaps it's beneficial for you to, to take payment over more than one year because of changing in, in your income or, or in your farm situation or whatever. And so those, that should be um, discussed and, and, and uh, thought about with a tax professional before you go ahead and, and sign a lease. But you certainly will have a tax liability um, at both the, the federal and the state level. So there, there's this need for financial planning. And, and while that need is, is great when you get that bonus payment up front, um, if and when you start to receive royalty, there is certainly a, a even greater need for financial planning. A colleague of mine at Penn State University, a county agent who uh, his parents live in northeastern Ohio, and they had four of these wells drilled on their very small dairy farm in northeastern Pennsylvania, I think almost two years ago, very early on in, in the infancy of this, this industry in Pennsylvania. They, they get a royalty check of $130,000 a month. And he said to me, he said, you can't imagine the problems that you get when you get a check for $130,000 a month. He said, do you know the problems that occur with getting a check for $130,000 a month? My response was, no, I don't, but I'd love to take that problem off your hands just for a month or two. But he had a very good point that there's this really acute need for financial planning, especially when the, when the royalty starts. There's this need for estate planning. Um, maybe when we had a very small 75 cow um, dairy operation that maybe was not economically sustainable long term, um, certainly when, when uh, gas leases are involved and, and royalties at that size are involved, there's going to be a, a much greater need for estate planning and for farm business succession. Um, what, what some folks in Pennsylvania have told us their experiences have been is many times there, there may be several children, several heirs who didn't have an interest in the farm business. Maybe that 75 cow dairy certainly couldn't support more than one family and, and, and certain heirs were not interested in the farm business. Once this resource is developed and, and the property, if you will, is, is a lot more profitable, um, there's a lot greater interest in, in the farm business. And so this whole issue of estate planning and farm business succession becomes even greater um, when gas leases are involved. So what can you do if you're interested in, in, in exploring this? Obviously, just like you're doing today, today educate yourself about the industry, about leasing, um, and, and about financial planning. Uh, OSU Extension and Ohio Farm Bureau have been doing workshops on all these topics for the last few years. Um, they, are, they are spread throughout at least the, the eastern half of, of, of the state, and I, I think they're spreading even farther than that as landmen go to, to counties in, in western Ohio. Um, we have workshops on just leasing. You know, if you're going to sign a lease, we, we have um, attorneys come in that are knowledgeable about oil and gas. We have our extension specialists uh, in farm management that come in, and we do a whole night workshop on what to do, how, how to structure leases, how to negotiate leases with landmen so that uh, all the things that I mentioned earlier in this, in this uh, presentation are included in your, in your lease. Um, as time goes on, we're starting to develop um, um, other formats of the, that education, fact sheets, um, presentations online such as this one, and those will continue. If you're needing to, to get that information, call your local OSU County Extension Office in your community. They can certainly point to you uh, where those resources are. If they're not in your community, they may be in another community, and, and that will certainly be your, your, your first step to finding out where that is. Talk with your neighbors. Um, it's very beneficial to form a landowner group. Um, the landmen will treat more favorably and, and give uh, more profitable leases to larger areas of ground. Uh, in other words, in, instead of dealing with four landowners that, that each have 150 acres, they would much rather um, deal with a group together. Um, there will be one lease, 
Um, everybody will have their own individual lease as part of that landowner group, but your negotiating power is greater you know, with greater numbers. And so we're seeing lots of these form. Um, one caveat or warning, um, we're starting to see um, being in a landowner group is good, and being in a landowner group gives you some negotiating power. But the landowner group certainly has to be beneficial to all the landowners. Um, we have seen some landowner groups that have been formed um, by folks who don't have a vested interest. Someone from outside the community that is just learning, uh, just uh, interested in forming a landowner group to charge you a fee. And there's nothing wrong with paying a professional for a fee, but we need to make sure that, that professional is going to be able to to bring some experience. Uh, isn't somebody who's just trying to to profit um, off of signing a lease, but somebody who has experience with some part of the industry. So talk to your your neighbors, see what their intentions are, see if they want to learn more about the industry, see if they're interested in in forming a landowner group. Um, your again, your local extension office. Many extension educators have experience with these landowner groups. We have them in many counties in eastern Ohio, and so we we see some best management practices, if you will, of what works best with these landowner groups, um, both in operation and execution, and, and there we can point you to, to groups that you can go, uh, even if they're not in your geographic area, you can go and learn from them and see what has worked for them. How do they structure their lease? What did they find most valuable as they negotiated with, uh, with an entity to get their, their lease signed? And obviously, I can't, can't say enough about consulting a knowledgeable attorney. Uh, again, visit your local extension office, call your Farm Bureau organizational director. There are these lists that we can share of folks who have participated in professional development opportunities just on oil and gas for attorneys, and also who, who have served many other clients. Many other farmers have gone to these, these attorneys, and so uh, you, you've got to identify one. It doesn't have to be in your community. A lot of times when we think about visiting a, a tax professional, an attorney, we, we think about the, the town square downtown where we, we do our banking or business. And, and this, th that person doesn't have to physically be in your community. Most of this work can be done no matter where they are. And so uh, e even in, in some parts of Ohio, if we don't yet have attorneys who are familiar with this industry, uh, you, you can go to an attorney that may not be in the geographic area close to, to where you live or where you farm. Obviously, take time to consider your options. Uh, there, the, this resource isn't going anywhere. It's been down there for a few million years. Um, somebody who tells you you've got to sign by next Friday or we're going to stop uh, buying leases in, uh, in your county at the end of August. Uh, I, I'm not saying that's not true, but that certainly is not an, enough reason for you to sign something that you're either not comfortable with or you don't know about or you haven't uh, had vetted uh, from, from counsel, from, from uh, an attorney. There are some really good online websites that you can go to, and here's a few of them. Um, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources has a great um, uh, website um, that has lots of information. It has maps of where um, these wells have been permitted so far in Ohio. It has information about the companies that are doing the drilling. And then it has lots of information uh, for landowners. There's a whole fact sheet series that um, they have put together um, on different topics. You know, Everything from if you're going to get a water test, um, just for baseline testing, what should you even be testing for if you have concerns about oil and gas? Um, lots of fact sheets are available on that website for landowners. Um, extension, our OhioLine.osu um, website, uh, we're starting to put our, our fact sheets that are very specific towards this resource there. And there's lots of other fact sheets on um, farm business management, farm succession, tax planning, um, farm management that need to be done in, in concurrently with, with considering a, an oil and gas lease. All of those resources are on our, our well site. Penn State University has a wonderful well site. Penn State has helped uh, Ohio State University Extension for the last couple of years. Um, we went to them and, and, and said, you guys have been through this. Uh, help us learn how we can work with landowners. And what they told us was is they went to Texas and learned from Texas. Um, but they have the best website uh, that I've seen, the most comprehensive web website, if you will, on the Marcellus. Um, you won't see many maps or many um, references to the Utica deposit simply because um, that deposit is not in, in, in Pennsylvania. Um, but they, they, their landowner resources uh, are very varied and, and they've got uh, many more years experience than we do with this industry and, and many landowners have benefited from going to the Penn State Marcellus site there. And then the, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette has a, a website where they, they have a lot of um, uh, resources that may not be geared towards landowners per se on how to negotiate leases or work with 
um, with companies on this resource, but I found some really good um, background information on the industry, um, mostly nationally, but but some in, in Pennsylvania, and 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 it gives kind of a really good broader understanding of the industry and and why this is is affecting um, us in Ohio right now, and and I'm sure as time goes on there will be additional um, web resources available. If you're interested in learning more about leasing your property for oil and gas, probably the first place to go is your local county extension office. Um, that, that professional will know if there's a workshop schedule in, in your area or they can tell you where the closest one is. We also have some printed materials that you can access and, and other uh, management materials that you might want to use to help plan uh, if you are considering leasing your ground for oil and gas in the future.